Hi everyone, I'm Carl from Cedro Alto, and this is Coffee Economics with Carl. Last week was our first episode on some of the fundamentals of microeconomics, including price theory and how the price of a good is determined by the supply of a good and the demand for it. If you missed that one, you can check it right up here. This week we're going to try our best to answer a question that I have a feeling a lot of people have out there, but may be a little embarrassed to ask. And that is, why do green coffee prices change? If anyone's ever asked this question to a so-called expert, they've probably received some kind of a smug response uh, somewhere along the lines of, well, it's supply and demand. It's the market. There's so many people out there making coffee, so many people drinking coffee, the price has got to change. But if anyone's ever thought about how coffee more or less always costs the same to a consumer, but the income of a producer is always changing, you've probably thought to yourself, why don't we just have one price? If you've ever asked this question and been unsatisfied with the answer, I'm gonna do my best to give you a better one. Here's our sheet from the video last week, where we really just established that the market clearing price or the equilibrium price is where supply meets demand. Something I didn't mention explicitly last week is that the level of supply and the level of demand are not absolute numbers. At one level of demand, a different quantity will be demanded at every price. That's why this curve here this isn't a list of possible demands given another condition. This is the level of demand. So if price is at one dollar, this, this quantity is demanded. If price is at one dollar fifty, this quantity is demanded. This demand curve shows the quantity of coffee that would be purchased at any price level at one moment in time. The same goes for the supply curve. At one moment in time, all of these quantities expressed on the x-axis would be produced and offered on the market given any of these price points expressed here on the y-axis. I want to mention that because as we talk about supply and demand changing, these are not movements up and down in these curves. Changes in supply and demand are movements of the entire curve. Movements of supply or demand, which are shifts of the entire curve, change where we find the equilibrium point where the market is cleared. So let's start with the fast answer. Why do coffee prices change? Coffee prices change to clear the market. Isn't that an elegant answer? That's exactly why prices have to change. Because all of the coffee offered on the market any day or at any point in time has to be purchased. But you didn't come here for another simple smug answer. You came here for the explanation as to why. Let's take a look at this graphically with another supply curve and a demand curve. So we can see how market equilibrium changes as supply and or demand change and dictate that the price must change in order for the market to continue to clear. This curve here is demand. So at a high price, the quantity is low that will be purchased. At a low price, the quantity is higher. If something is cheaper, you may buy more of it or more people will buy it. If it's very expensive, you'll buy less of it or less people will buy it. Over here is our supply curve. If the price is very low, very little will be produced and offered on the market. If the price is very high, it's a more interesting business to devote resources to, so more quantity will be produced and sold. Where these two meet is the equilibrium price, which is the perfect price at which everything that is offered is purchased. Everyone who wants coffee at that price gets a chance to purchase it, and everyone who wants to sell coffee at that price gets to sell it. Let's call this E1 for equilibrium. Let's call this price $1.20, just as an example. There are a few things we need to keep in mind about this situation before we start making changes. One is that equilibrium is fleeting. If you look at the New York Sea price for Arabica coffee, you notice it changes constantly. Uh, the website I use is updates like every one or two minutes or something. But at, at any moment in time, coffee is being purchased. So demand is, is being diminished. Supply is being diminished when a purchase is made. New coffee is always being offered on the market. And people always want a little more coffee. 
there's constantly pressure in both directions on supply as well as on demand. These curves are constantly moving and therefore the point where they meet each other is always moving. A second point to consider is that the market must clear. There can be no coffee left at the end of the day to wait to sell tomorrow. All coffee has a price. Not all sellers of all coffee accept all prices. But in theory, any amount of coffee can be sold by adjusting the price. Price movements ensure that the market clears. So what happens when supply increases? For example, there is a, a bumper crop or an above average harvest in Brazil. As the largest producer, what happens in Brazil has the greatest impact on overall global coffee prices. So let's just take that example. More coffee was harvested in Brazil than had been expected. This would cause the supply curve to shift outward because quantity is increasing. Let's call this one S2. Let's call our initial price P1 and our initial quantity Q1. So let's say at the beginning of this exercise, buyers are happy paying $1.20, sellers are happy selling at $1.20, the quantity that they're buying and selling. All of a sudden, the quantity increases, the quantity being offered increases. Uh, people are so happy selling at $1.20 that everybody decides to produce more one year. So the supply curve shifts outward. And then the sellers are going to say, well, you liked Q1, let's say, I don't know, 80 million bags. You liked 80 million bags at $1.20 a pound. How about 100 million bags? At what price? Well, $1.20. You like that price, right? Well, this would be great for the sellers, of course. So they're going to try to move straight outward, same price, more quantity. They love it. But then the buyers say, well, if you want us to take 100 million bags, we're going to need that all the way down here at $1 per pound. Because you know, for $1.20, 80 million bags was really just enough. If you want me to buy more, I'm going to need a better price. So we go down here to $1, $1 where consumers or demanders will be happy with this quantity. But of course, the suppliers say, no, you know, at, at, at $1, it's really not worth producing those additional 20 million bags. So they negotiate and, and argue, and we end up somewhere in between. In this case, right here, where supply curve meets the demand curve, just as before. Let's say this is about 90 million bags. And let's call this Q2, because this is the, the second equilibrium point here for our second supply curve. And that's inevitably going to be a lower price than before because quantity is higher, but it's not going to be quite as low as $1 because the quantity isn't quite as high as what the suppliers had proposed. Let's say it ends up at about $1.10. So this is our new equilibrium point. So in summary, because the quantity offered, supplied, increased, the only way to make sure all of that coffee got sold was to lower the price. So in this example, supply S2, supply 2, there was an increase in supply. In this graph, we're assuming a constant demand, although of course in reality that's impossible because both curves are always changing. Price falls in order to absorb additional supply. It falls because sellers need to compete for buyers. Buyers who were satiated by 80 million bags paying 120 a pound need some additional motivation if they're going to take additional coffee. Now let's look at the opposite. What happens when supply is reduced? Let's say this blue line is S3 or supply 3. This is a lower supply than we started with because it's further left on the quantity axis. Let's say that leading up to the harvest there was poor weather in Brazil. So the global supply was reduced. Just as in the first example, as supply is reduced and the supply curve shifts inward, demand stays constant, so our equilibrium point will be moving up along the demand curve to meet the new supply curve. So in this case, a reduction in supply with constant demand, the price must rise to account for scarcity.
In contrast with the first example when supply rose, in this case when supply contracts, buyers must compete amongst themselves for the supply that's available. Now that we have a basic understanding of what's going on behind the scenes with supply and demand that causes prices to rise and fall, let's take a look at a couple slightly more complex examples where both supply and demand are changing. Here's our supply curve, S1, as in, in all these examples. And this is a general rule that almost all the time, when price is lower, quantity supply is, is going to be lower. When price is higher, quantity supply is going to be higher. Of course, there are some strange exceptions that we may get into later, but let's just take that as fact. Demand generally is going to be the opposite, D1 here. So this is our starting point. So let's see what happens when supply increases. So just like our first example on the other page here, S2, the supply curve shifts outward. There's additional supply in the market. And the equilibrium point is going to move from right here down the demand curve to right here. Here is equilibrium one, here is equilibrium two. Increase in supply, downward pressure on price. We said downward pressure and not downward movement in price because we're about to see that there could simultaneously be upward pressure on price from the demand side. So let's say at the same time as supply is increasing, demand is also increasing. So this demand curve shifting outward represents an increase in demand. So an increase in the quantity demanded at all prices versus the initial demand curve. Let's call this D2. So at our initial equilibrium point, we have P1, so the price at that point, and Q1, the quantity at that point. At E2, equilibrium two, or the new equilibrium based on the new, so the second supply curve, we have P2, the price, and Q2, the quantity demanded at that price. At our new equilibrium point, so where our, our initial demand curve meets our second supply curve, we have P2, the price, which is lower at that point because of additional supply with the same demand, and Q2, our second quanti quantity level, which is the quantity supplied and demanded at P2 price point. We've just introduced another, another change. This is an outward shift in demand, so an increase in demand, or an increase in the quantity demanded at all prices compared with the initial demand. And we can see that D2, demand 2, intersects with supply 2 at this point here. So compared with E2, the outward shift in demand applied upward pressure on price. So an increase in supply initially caused a reduction in price. Our second change, which is an increase in demand, caused an upward shift in price. So here at E3, our price is back up to P1, and our quantity rose further to Q3 here. Of course, it's rare that these, that these changes in, of supply and demand will cause the price to remain exactly where it was before. But this example is just intended to show that there are likely many forces at work at any given time applying upward as well as downward pressure on supply as well as demand. Neither of the two are ever going to be completely constant. In an open, efficient market like green coffee, it would be rare for either supply or demand to ever be constant. Let's do one more in which we have a falling supply and rising demand. Here's our supply curve, S1. Here's our demand curve, D1. They meet at our equilibrium point, E1, which dictates an equilibrium price of P1 and an equilibrium quantity of Q1. Let's say there's a drop in supply. So the supply curve is going to shift inward, going this way. This is S2, supply 2. This is our new equilibrium point because demand remained constant and supply decreased. This put upward pressure on our price, so our new equilibrium price, P2, is higher than P1. Because demand remained the same with lower supply, there will be more competition among buyers for a smaller amount of coffee. So we have Q2, 
lower quantity at a higher price. Let's say at the same time, demand increase for some reason. So our demand curve shifts outward. This is D2. So more coffee is demanded, but supply is not moving from S2. So the price must rise in order to motivate more sellers to enter the market. So from here, price rises to P3 and quantity also rises right back to the same spot as Q1. So from our initial equilibrium point, a reduction in supply caused price to rise and quantity to fall. And from there, an increase in demand caused our price to rise further and our quantity to rise back to the initial point. If there's one thing that I hope that everyone that was unfamiliar with this subject matter before this video will take away, these changes in price are cold robotic movements caused by the aggregate of millions of personal decisions going on every day. There's no Wizard of Oz behind the coffee price determining what the price is going to be one day or another. When the FNC here in Colombia releases a, a PDF file every morning with the base price for all coffee that day, it doesn't rise because they're feeling generous. It doesn't fall because they're feeling hawkish that day. Of course, there are manipulations which we will get into later on. But it's important to keep in mind that at the fundamental base level, at an aggregate level, these movements are happening essentially automatically. Because the scale is so large, it would be impossible for there to be someone standing behind all of this pulling levers. These are the natural forces that we have to understand and respect as we try to make real changes in how coffee is traded. If we ignore supply and demand and the way equilibrium price is determined, we're bound to fail. And again, this is just a foundation for some more complex and more, frankly, interesting topics we're going to be getting into in the next few videos here. I just wanted to make all of this extremely clear so that we don't get crossed up later on when we start talking in more complex terms. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks for keeping up with the series. If you're interested in checking out the videos that got us here, there's a link below to the playlist. And if you're interested in keeping up with future videos that will be coming out bi-weekly from now on, please consider subscribing. Just really quickly here in Colombia, we're in the middle, getting towards the peak of a big harvest here. We have spot coffees in Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and the US. And we're currently processing pre-ship samples and taking bookings for the current harvest. If you're interested in working with us to source green coffee, feel free to get in touch. My contact information is below in the description. Thank you.